Have you ever experienced something so crippling in your life that has made you feel broken? I have. Are you someone who has a giving heart but is struggling to feel good themselves? Are you consistently putting your needs aside to take care of everyone else? If so, you're not alone. Giving starts with giving to yourself so that you are able to give of yourself to other people. Isn't it time you took back control and discovered what makes you tick? Join me in my journey and find out how you can feel better about yourself, live your best life, and share that with others. Thinking of yourself, it doesn't make you selfish. It makes you brave. I'm Nelia, and this is the Giving Starts With You podcast. Welcome to the Giving Starts With You podcast. I'm your host, Nelia Hutt. Thank you so much for joining us for another day and another episode, you know, where we bring hope into your into your world. And so today we have a wonderful guest on here and her name is Susan Combs. Susan, how are you? I'm great today. It's if you got me yesterday, not so good, but today was a lot better. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. I usually usually say that at work too. Yeah, if you got me on a Tuesday, we're good. And it's a Tuesday. (laughs) So I am excited to share who Susan is. So Susan L. Coombs is president of the Coombs & Company, a full service insurance brokerage based in New York City. Susan started the company at 26 years old with the drive to do more better. The internal mantra has resulted in numerous successes and firsts, like being named the youngest national president of the over 85 year history of women in insurance and financial services and the first female broker of the year winner for benefits pro (laughs) this is awesome susan is a missouri girl in a new york world and it's the lessons she learned during midwestern upbringing and two plus decades in new york city that are the basis of her book The insights contained in these pages come from family, friends, colleagues, and life in general, but the most important teachings are from her late father. It was his steady guidance in life that set Susan's foundation, and it was was his passing that inspired her new movement, Pancakes for Rogers. (laughs) When Susan's not running her business or trying to help others through her own challenges, you can find her flipping tires at her (laughs) beloved CrossFit gym, awesome, supporting the Missouri Tigers, KC Chiefs, and Royals, or slaying the dragons that have come her way. (laughs) Susan, I love, love, love the title, Pancakes for Roger. Thank you you again for taking the time, you know, to come on here and share your message with everybody. There's so many things we could dive into today. Um, Can you just start with telling us a little bit, I know we heard a little bit in the intro about who you are, but Mm -hmm. I don't know, like on this show, rather than just ask you, you know, for a bit of your backstory, there is something that I tend to ask my guests. And with you, I'm going to ask you right at the beginning, because I think this will give me an insight a little bit to what's happening. (laughs) So um, what would you say is the biggest gift that you have ever given to yourself in your life or one of the biggest that's changed how you ultimately feel or see yourself? Ooh, <laughs> start it's coming tough. in hot, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I just, you know, most of the people that are listening are people that um, are just in the beginning stages of giving themselves permission to yeah. do something, to make them, because, you know, we all have these like, inner thoughts of things that we think, you know, this is who we are. This is what we believe people to tell us and all of these things. And for me, it was, you know, oh my goodness, I'm too hyper. Like I feel too much. And so people used to laugh at me and stuff. So one of the biggest gifts I gave to myself was just celebrating my heart. And that's the thing that now I love the most about me are things that I was ridiculed about before. So giving the gift of just being who I am. So I'm just interested. I'm interested. 
Yeah, um, I would say, you know, maybe a couple of things. Um, so, you know, I, I mentor quite a bit. And one of the things I always say to people that I mentor, you know, I'm in the insurance and financial services industry. And, you know, it's, it's about 14% women in my industry. So it's a a lot of, you know, old boys club and things like that. And, you know, I, I've mentored a lot and I've always told people that when you're sitting down with somebody and sitting down, just because I think a lot of times with women, we second guess ourselves and we, you know, we can have problems with confidence and we can have problems with feeling like we deserve that seat at the table. So when I mentor people, I always say that as soon as you can flip the switch and realize the person sitting across from you needs you more than you need them that's when the switch flips. And I know, and it's not meant to be from an arrogant standpoint. It's just saying that the reason that you're sitting across the table from that person is because you're an expert in your field and they're coming to you for help. So you need to own that seat and just show up that way for yourself, not only for the, the client that you're sitting in front of. So anytime I meet with somebody that's new in the industry, I always tell them that. And, and it doesn't even have to be an insurance. It can just be in your chosen field that just believing in yourself, I think is, is huge. I mean, I was always the kid that put so much more pressure on myself than anybody ever did, you know, uber type A, um, you know, overachiever type of person. But, you know, I think once I, I was able to flip that switch early on in my career, then it, it just flourished. Um, the other thing I would say that, um, you know, how sometimes you make a decision and you don't realize how much it's going to impact your life until later in, at the time. So, you know, you mentioned that I started my company at 26 years old. I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and, I, and it was like, hey, kid, what are you trying to sell me? You know, And, you know, I, when I set up my company, I set it up to be mobile from the very beginning. So I've always felt that if you have your computer and you have your phone, you can work anywhere in the world and which I have. And, you know, I know that we're probably we're going to get into you know, my father passing. And by setting my company up that way, I was able to be present and to show up for my family repeatedly over the years that my dad was sick. And then ultimately, you know, I basically moved back to Missouri for the summer before he passed away, but I was able to do it. So it was like one of those things is you just never realize that the decision you make can impact you in such a major way. And that was such a gift to myself to be able to be present for my family and really cherish the, those last moments with my father as well. Yeah, it gave you that freedom, the freedom to be there. And the, yeah, it's so important, especially when, when we're faced with things in our lives that we, we want to be a part of, we have to be a part of, right? Um, thank you for those. Those are beautiful gifts. And the first one that you mentioned, just really quickly, I learned that as well. Um, but it was hard, but it was so important. Like, you need to know how to show up for the people that are, because they need you more than you need to hear yourself speaking really right and it's yeah. so true and if we can remember that it, it, like you said it's it's for our confidence but it's also it brings out the best I think in in our messages too so thank you for sharing that that's a beautiful gift I appreciate that yeah. so who was Roger tell us about your dad Roger was my dad he was he was awesome he really was he was you know my my I have and I let me just start by saying I know not everybody has good fathers and, um, and so I, I definitely recognize that in, in my book because I, you know, I feel like I had one of the best. And so, you know, if somebody needs to borrow a concept of dad, you know, they can borrow the concept of my dad for sure. Yeah. So my, my father was, he was served our armed forces for 39 years and four, four months. He would always want me to make sure I got that four months in there because he earned it. Um, and in his civilian life, he was also a judge, um, but he was, I grew up in a town of a thousand people and he was a pillar of the community. He was on the church board. He was, you know, an advisor to many. He was a mentor to many. And he was really ultimately my first mentor. And so I really learned how to help others and to be a mentor by the example that he set for me. He sounds remarkable. Yeah. He sounds yeah. remarkable. Um, how long has he been, has he been gone now? Um, he passed away August 22nd, 2018. Um, so I guess we're, we're coming up on four years, but you, you know, I mean, I know you've lost your father too. I mean, it, it can seem like yesterday, some days for sure. So, yes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that you lost him. And, um, yeah, I hope that your family has, is finding peace and that, you know, you remember, you keep talking about him, right? Because it's so important to keep them with us and, mm -hmm. and, and to care. so I'm so glad that you're here talking about him today. Yeah. So pancakes for Roger, what is that all about? 
So the movement started basically, um, you know, my father passed away ultimately of Agent Orange related throat cancer. Um, he was a combat helicopter pilot in Vietnam mm -hmm. and um, he was sick the last 10 years of his life, but he, the last 10 years were relatively good. And it was the last year that he got very, very sick. And so that last year he had a feeding tube. He also was on oxygen. So I know that you have a lot of people that are dealing with grief on here. So um, you probably have people that have dealt with family members as caregivers that have had feeding tubes or had oxygen and kind of know what that entails. And so my dad and I were very regimented. We always had our schedule down. Um, and so I would wake up, I would check on him. If he was good, I'd go to the gym. If he was good when I got back, I'd get in the shower. If he was good after that, then I'd, you know, kind of get breakfast around and we kind of start the day that way. Um, but one morning when I was coming down from the shower, I um, came into the kitchen and he had beat me to the table. And I, I looked at him and I said, what are you doing? And he was setting the table and he said, I want pancakes for breakfast. And if you've dealt with somebody with a feeding tube, you know that that's just not in the cards. And since he was on oxygen, it was apparent that he, his oxygen levels had gone low. And so he had some confusion that morning. And I looked at him and I said, oh, dad, you know, there's nothing in this world that I want to give you more than pancakes, but you know, you have a feeding tube and we have, you know, he was on hospice. We had a, a DNR, a do not resuscitate order. And I just looked at him and I said, you know, if you choke, we're done here. And I just don't think we're quite ready to be done. And so of course he said, yes, I can. <laughs> and he said, Matt said I could. And Matt's my brother, who's a nurse. And Matt okay. wasn't there that morning. So I knew that there we were dealing with confusion. And so I looked at him, I said, well, let me see what I can do. So I took his feeding tube formula over to the microwave. This man always wanted it warmed up for 14 seconds, not 13, not 15. It had to be 14 or he knew it. So I heated it up for 14 seconds and I put it on the table and he said to me, he said, what's that? And I said, well, there's your syrup. And so his oxygen levels had kind of come rallied around a little bit and he kind of, you know, smiled at me and kind of nodded his head, resigned, knew, knew, okay, yeah, I get it. And so a few weeks later when he passed away, I had shared the story. I had shared with the story with a lot of people prior to that, but, um, you know, I, my husband said, I took one day off work when I came back, um, to New York after he passed away. And my husband said, why don't we go have some pancakes for your dad Aww. and just to honor him. So we went to our local diner my husband took a picture and, um, and I, I, told the story on, on social media. And I said, so I said, if you're so inclined today, go have some pancakes for Roger. Because at the end of the day, it's just about the little things in life that add up to being the big things. And you never know when enjoying a stack of pancakes can be taken away from you. So, uh -huh. um, so that's kind of how the whole movement started. And then his birthday is February 22nd. So every February, uh, my company has actually aligned ourselves with the University of Missouri Veterans Clinic at the law school. Okay. And so for every pancake loving picture that we get on social media, the month of February, <laughs> my company makes a donation to the veterans clinic in his honor. So okay. the veterans clinic provides free legal services for veterans navigating the VA claims and appeals process. That can be a pretty arduous process to say the least. So that's kind of how the whole pancakes for Roger, you know, movement got started. And then um, I got a wild idea to write a book <laughs> you know, about nine months ago. Um, and Congratulations on writing the book. Thank you. So, so that's, it, it was so funny because I had had people after me to write a book for quite a while. And when I speak publicly, I always end my talks with unsolicited advice. There are just kind of some fun quotes and anecdotes that people and mentors of mine have passed along to me. And I always thought it would be a really cool concept for a book, like have the, the quote be the name of the chapter and give some insight to the person. So that's what it started out being. I thought my dad was going to be a chapter. And then my dad, as you know, he did just took over the whole freaking book. <laughs> and so, he's, so he is definitely, you know, sprinkled throughout the entire book. Um, as well as several of my other mentors, but he, so when the book was finished being written and we were trying to decide on titles and everything, it was just obvious yeah. what it, what it had to be. And so that's, that's where the, the premise of the book comes from too. Oh, I love that so much. Cause it's so meaningful, right? He would be so proud of you for writing about him and, you know, right. Finishing the book. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah, I think so. Well, and it's, I've been, so many people have reached out to me from the veterans community too. Mm. And that's just been, and I mean, even, I mean, I, I was interviewed on, on veterans radio uh, in March and um, I had a gentleman that emailed me 
10 minutes after that interview and he's telling me a story about he knew my dad and everything and that my dad had guided him and been a mentor to him. And so, I mean, that's just as a, as a child, it's, it's so rewarding. And that's one of the things that when my father passed away, I had a lot of people that came with those stories mm -hmm. and it, it definitely changed me. And it made me understand that when I know somebody that's passed away and I have a story about that person, I always share it with their loved ones because I know how meaningful it is. And I think until you're in, you know, the club um, of, of losing a parent or, or a child or a spouse, or, you know, we all have our different clubs. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think until you're a member of the club, you don't truly understand it. I think we can always sympathize. I think, you know, you probably did that. I, I know I did that um, where okay. somebody say, oh, I lost my father. I lost my mother. And you, you're saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss, my condolences. And then you kind of move on because you don't know what else to do. But then when you're indoctrinated into the club, then you totally understand it. And so then you know how much it means when somebody shares a story of your loved one that's passed. So that's been, you know, a, a gift that I was given actually after my father passed that it's, you know, been mine to pass along to other people as it, as it comes up. Especially if there's stories that you've never heard before, they give you sort of, see, I don't know about you, but until I was a teenager, like my whole life up until, I don't know, 15 or 16, I didn't see my parents as other human beings. Like I just, <laughs> I saw them as just my parents, like, like, it's like, I would see a teacher, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it wasn't until I hit those, those years that I was like, oh, they have their own life. Like, you know, they have their things that they love. They have their personality. They have all of the, they had a whole life before they even met each other. Yeah. Never mind had me and my brother. And, yeah. and it always fascinated me that I wasn't, my brother and I weren't like the center of their world, like forever, <laughs> you know, and it was sort of like this out of body experience. And then when somebody does come to you um, and share those stories with you, it's, it's, better than any amount of money um that you could get you know it's just beautiful so I completely understand yeah my mom calls that period BC before children <laughs> <laughs> I love that so much and it's like one of the things I was afraid of was forgetting the way my father sounded so forgetting the way his you know his his voice right so any of these things that make you laugh or just make you think, oh, I didn't know that. Like how many other things didn't I know, right? So I think it's great. And especially because he spent so much time serving. Yeah. He's probably had tons of stories, fascinating ones too, right? Yeah, yeah. This is amazing. Well, and it's just, and, um, and so my father, he was in three different branches of our armed services. So the first okay. branch he was in was, he was a Marine and once Marine, always Marine, right? That's a very big pride, um, prideful area in the, the United States. And um, so we had, I bet you we had 25 of those guys that had served with my dad in Vietnam that showed up for his funeral in Arlington. Wow. And it, and I mean, they up from all across the country. I mean, they just show up, they show up for each other and they've actually, um, allowed me to be part of their purple foxes, Facebook group, um, because that was their unit's name and which is really kind of cool. So I I'm able to share, you know, about the book with them and, oh, and you know, so and they go and eat pancakes for my dad and they take pictures and it's just really, really nice. Um, because the military, I mean, it's, it's a family. Very I mean, close knit. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, and that's the thing. I know I could call any one of those guys and be like, Hey, <laughs> I'm in jail. I need bail money. And <laughs> every single one of them would show up for me. So oh, what a relationship that must've been, you know, when you got to stick up for each other. Absolutely. I know that. So I haven't read your book, but I have read about your book and I would love to read your book and, and learn a little bit more about this. But one of the lessons I know that you talk about is the third site. Can you explain that a little bit? The love at third site? Yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> My husband's in the other room. <laughs> I'll be quiet now. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think a lot of times, um, I, I think especially with young girls, okay. um, we can romanticize romance. Okay. Right? We, can, we think that relationships should be a Hallmark movie the harp should play, the fireworks should go off and things like that. And, you know, real life isn't always like that. 
And, you know, I'm madly in love with my husband. He's definitely my soulmate, but I wasn't looking for him when I found him. And so it was one of those things that I met him at a Manhattan Chamber of Commerce networking event. And I, I mean, hell, I was married at the time, to be honest. And, oh. um, and so I wasn't thinking about having another husband, to be quite clear. Um, but it's just, we kept kind of running into each other. And then, um, you know, to be rather blunt, I mean, um, my first husband was kind of living off me and, and not, not doing too much to contribute to that relationship. And um, I started thinking about, you know what, what do I deserve? Mm. What do I deserve as a person? And, um, and I started thinking about like, you know, I could get a guy like this if I wanted to get a guy like this. And my man, my, my husband's really good looking and he's very smart and he's like the total package. So um, I was like, why the hell not do I deserve something like that? So <laughs> Th third sight later <laughs> oh my gosh but you know what all of these things all of this power was instilled in you by your parents right yeah. well, Why you I think too it's I think women change tremendously from the ages of 23 to 26 and so I say to all my little cousins do not get married before 26 <laughs> I mean, because I think as long as you're on your parents' payroll in some shape or form, you probably shouldn't be getting married. As, I mean, some people will disagree with me, but I, I strongly believe that because I think you need to know who you are as a person. Yeah. And I mean, the person I married at 23 was far different than the per person I married when I was, what, 30, 32, <laughs> you know? I mean, so yeah, it's I just, I that. think, hmm. I, and I think a lot of times young women, we mirror the person that we're with. Oh, you like to do this. I like to do this. Oh, this is what you want to do. I mean, have you seen that movie Runaway Bride where it's, um, where it's like, how does she like her eggs? She likes her eggs exactly as every single guy she was ever engaged to because she doesn't know herself. So that's a great example where it's like, if you start thinking about like I, my ex-husband who will remain nameless, um, he, um, he wanted to go hiking every Sunday morning at 6 a.m. So every single Sunday morning, we would get up at 6 a.m. and go hiking. It was fun in a while. And then I was like, you know, I, I started getting really resentful because that's not what I wanted to do on a Sunday morning. So, you know, but it's just, you know, oh, you like to do this. I like to do this type of thing. So I think it took a while before I really figured out who I was as a person. And so when I, I left him, um, he didn't change. I did. Mm. So I think I hadn't given myself a chance to really grow up as a person and really understand who I was so that um, when, when Sean, my, my husband came along, it was the right time and the right person. I mean, we've been together for almost 18 years now and we've been married for 11 or 12. He'll yell at me later for which <laughs> it's just, you know, it's like, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, um, I actually turned 43 this week. And so it's, it's getting to the point where it's like, I know I had a life before him, but I don't remember too much before. <laughs> so. Oh, that's so special. That's great. He's a good 50. Guy. I'll be 50 in a month. And I, yeah, I've been married. Well, I got married a week before my 24th birthday. But I can see how that would be true for most people. Like, yeah, and there's can, exceptions yeah. to the rule, just like you. You but know, I, I have plenty see, of friends like that. But it's true. Like what I knew at that age and what I knew, you know, 10 years later is completely different. So I'm glad. I think the secret too is to grow together. Yeah. Because I think if one person just remains where they are, it's it's very, it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you see a lot of times too that if people have kids right away, Mm. They, and if they got married really, really early into the relationship too, I mean, you see them more with like, say our parents' generations, because they didn't get a chance to get to know each other as a couple before having kids. Yeah. And so, I mean, my parents, yeah, my parents had been married, I think for four or five years before my brother was born. And so they had that time together so that they built the foundation and built the solid friendship. But I've had plenty of friends that have kids right away. And then when the kids are gone, they look at them and like, well, I don't like you when the kids aren't here, you know? Yeah. Or I don't know who you are anymore. Yeah. Right. I hear, I hear that. I'm glad you brought that up. I hear that a lot too. And for us, it was 10 years we were married before we had, children. but it's like, we had like, sort of like a, it took a little bit of um, changing the dance, you know, the way we used to do things and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, I don't know. It's just interesting, but to grow in a relationship, you have to give to yourself. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to take care of yourself to be able to find out who you are in order to be able to have something strong and something worth giving to somebody else. Right. 
So I don't think, I don't know about you, but for me, I didn't grow up learning how to take care of myself. I grew up learning how to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. And so that was like a whole learning curve for me, but it wasn't until I did that, that I could give more to the people who, who are around me and, and the people that deserve more from me. Right. Yeah. Well, isn't it funny? Like, and I, like it's so, you know, I, I'll have a bad day and what do I do? I go buy a gift for somebody else instead of like doing something for myself, you know, it's, I, I mean, I'm kind of past that now. I mean, I'll go buy myself a big cookie and then I come home and confess to my husband, I bought a big cookie, you know, but it's just, you know, I mean it, I, like in my twenties, I did that a lot where it's like, if I was having a bad day, let me do something nice for somebody else, which isn't a bad thing to do, but it's like, why not do something nice for you? And somebody else. And somebody else. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So was your dad a giver? I know in the service he was, he sounds yeah. like that's all he did in his life. You know? Yeah. I mean, my dad was very much a mentor. I mean, I've had so many people that have come out and said, you know, oh God, I wish your dad was here. I'd love to bounce something off him. I was like, yeah, you get in line. <laughs> you know? Oh, that so, sounds great. I mean, just an example of my dad. Um, so I, you know, I grew up in a town of 986 people and, you know, so itty bitty town. And I mean, you can walk the entire town in about five minutes, 10 minutes, you know, and, um, you know, the, the day after he passed away, I went to the gym because that was something, even when he was sick, I, I did that for myself every single morning because I found that if I didn't give myself a gift of that mm. for one hour, just for me, then everything could fall apart and I could just be depleted. So as long as I get, you know, did something for myself in the beginning to start my, then I knew that if I had to give everything else away the rest of the day, at least I started with, with filling my cup up. And so the day after my dad passed, I was coming back from the gym and I kept hearing like a clang, 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 clang. And something just told me to look up and I looked up in my little, you know, post office that I grew up a block from had put the flag at half mast for my dad. Aww. And so it's just like, if, if that doesn't tell you like, you know, what kind of person he was, I don't know what would, because it just, just shows that like the impact of a little town. And then, um, I think that same day, my brother went to pick up the mail and, um, and the postmaster said to my brother, she was like, you know, we just really loved your dad. She said one time, you know, a couple summers ago, it was really hot and your mom had been to pick up the mail and the, um, air conditioner had broken here. And so she mentioned it to your dad. And she said, the next thing we know, 10 minutes later, your dad's walking down there with, with bottles of water and a fan to make sure that we oh. like make it through the rest of the day. So we had never heard that story. And so it's just kind of cool that it just goes to the testament of his character. I mean, yeah. my dad grew up on a dairy farm. I mean, he was literally born on the farm and my dad, there was a Senator in Iowa it's a state above Missouri. And, um, that said, was quoted as saying, you know, I grew up on a dairy farm. Everything else is easy. And my dad used to love that quote because I mean, it's hard. I mean, it's 365 twice a day, you know, you, you don't get a day off. The cow's got to be milked. So, you know, I think that that hard work and, um, that was instilled in my dad is something he instilled in me too. Um, I've always been a hard worker, um, and just, you know, and I've never been one that, that's like things handed to me. I always feel like I want to earn it. Um, so I think that not, not everybody has that work ethic and that's okay. Um, I can be, you know, a lot of people say I'm a workaholic, but I really enjoy what I do. So I feel like it's, it's all right. Cause I like it. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, but you know, when you are a caregiver, it is easy to get depleted. Yeah. You know, um, I only took care of my dad for about four or five months um, during the time that he was sick, but it was, you don't really know how emotionally draining it is until you don't have that to do anymore yeah. because you just, you don't think about it at the time. You just do every single thing that you know you need to do and that you want to do. Um, it's not until after they don't, you know, uh, perhaps they've passed away or somebody else comes in to help and that you really realize the, you know, what, what hit, what it has done. Um, you know, even just the part of taking care, right? I mean, although we love them so much, it does take a toll as well. Oh, I look at pictures of myself from back then. I look 10 years older. Yeah. I mean, I was, cause I was literally sleeping on the couch next in the room next to him, you know, with a baby monitor. So if he made a noise or he needed something, because he was a fall risk, 
And so if he would get up to go to the bathroom, we just, or he would turn over, he'd cough, or we'd have to, you know, make sure his oxygen, you know, nasal cannula was in place. And it just, I mean, I wear like a heart rate monitor now um, that I sleep in and I'm glad that I didn't have it then <laughs> because I think I would have been like, oh my God, girl, your life sucks. <laughs> because I, but, you know, but I think, and I don't know about you um, because it sounds like your father was ill before he passed too. Um, but I also think, I mean, when my dad was so sick, I mean, I, I would pray before I went into the room that he would be gone because I just knew how much he was suffering. I mean, I, I was so close to my dad. And I remember that before we put him on hospice, um, it was a family decision. It wasn't him declaring it. It wasn't us saying, this is what's going to be. It was a family discussion. And I remember him saying, you know, it hurts so much because we've loved so much. Yes. And it's so, so true. But it, for me, and I've talked to a couple other people that have told me that they relate to this too. Um, after they pass, it's almost like your mind plays tricks on you that you don't remember the bad stuff. You only remember them when they were healthy and good, which makes you miss them even more. So I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if that you experienced that too, but it's it, opposite, complete opposite. Really? Okay. All I could think about for 12 years after my father died was how much suffering he went through. Wow. It was horrible. I couldn't remember any of the good things. I didn't want to remember anything. Because I just, I kept having these wow. nightmares that he was buried alive. And I remember having, asking the coroner, because so my father died at home. He didn't want to be in, in, in uh, palliative yeah, care. And hospice. Hospice. Yeah. And, and I remember before they, they carried him out, I had them check two, three times to make sure, because I just, yeah, I couldn't deal with it. But it wasn't the fact that he wasn't there because it was a little bit of a relief. I know that sounds horrible. No, but. I but the suffering, you know, but for me, it, that's the part. It wasn't so much that he, he wasn't with us anymore. It was, he didn't deserve all of that stuff. And I just couldn't get past that. So for me, it was, I think that is why it took me so long. Cause it was com like, I don't know. I don't think we ever, nobody ever has a timeline and everybody grieves in a different way. And it doesn't mean, you know, you're good one day, you have to be good the next and that's okay. You know, like I've learned so much um, since then, before then, during then, you know, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it, it's made me who I am today too, right? But it's so interesting, like the, just the different perspectives, right? For going through something very, very similar. Um, and, you know, so my, my dad was on hospice, but we had a hospice at home. And so, you know, and I think, you know, I live in New York City. And so I was back there. I mean, i basically relocated back there, but then I would bounce back and forth from New York ever so often. And so I had kind of resigned myself that I might not be there when he passed. And I had to be okay with that because I knew that the guilt that I would hold on to would be tremendous if I, I couldn't come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had that in my head that, you know what, it was probably a, a coin flip if I was going to be there. Um, and I had literally come back to New York, I think a day or two. And my brother called me, he's like, Susan, you got to come back. He said, we're getting close. Mm. And um, so there's a book that I read. I can't even tell you who the name of the author is, but it's called Midwife for the Souls. Mm. And it's written by a hospice nurse. And um, I work um, a lot as an expert witness on medical malpractice claims. So I work with a lot of doctors and nurses. So right. a nurse recommended this book to me. And I finished reading the book on the plane back to Missouri. Um, a day before my father passed away. And I was so grateful that I did because it even, it taught you about what signs to look for on before they're getting ready to pass. So, at, you know, we had a, a rule in our house that if, if anybody woke up for any reason, you checked on dad, no matter what, if you got to have to get a drink, to go to the bathroom, you just checked on him. And so one morning it, it was three in the morning, I got up and I checked on him and there were just, there were a lot of signs that made me think like, we're, we're getting really close. And I woke up my brother and I said, I think we're getting close. He said, yeah, I do too. He said, I just checked on him. And I said, what do you want to do? You want me to wake up mom? And he said, yeah, why don't we do that? And we go sit with him. And so I woke up my mom and, um, because my dad had been dying the day before he literally, the nurse was there. My mom was there. And she said, he he's leaving, he's going. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, Oh, but Matt's on his way home and his oxygen letter literally went to zero and it came back up. And then my brother got there because hearing's the last thing that goes. And my brother and mother had been talking about Susan's flying home, Susan's flying home. So he waited for me. 
Mm. And um, I got goosebumps. And so it, you know, it's three o'clock. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so th- three o'clock in the morning, I got my mom up and got my brother up and we went and we just sat around his hospital bed and we talked about our favorite vacations that we took as a family mm. and what some of our favorite memories were. And, um, and, and we were just, we had our hands on him. And I remember, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, I had my hand on the inside of his elbow and, um, you know, I, where I could feel his pulse. Mm. And then at five 30 on the dot, it just stopped. And, um, and I looked at my brother, I said, he's gone. And, and my brother's a nurse. So he had a stethoscope and everything. He checked, and he's like, he's gone. And, um, but what in five 30 is when my dad used to get up to go to oh. work. <laughs> yeah. So we were like on true military fashion, five 30 on the dot, but uh-huh. it was, it was so, I was so happy. I was there. I didn't, I didn't think I would, I, I, you know, like I said, I had resigned myself to, to know that I might not be there, but I was so fortunate and so glad that I was there and that my brother was there and my sister-in-law was there for my brother and my mom was there and we were just, we were there together as a family. So it was, you know, it was one of those beautiful things that, um, you know, you don't, you don't really think about, um, but it's, it, it just is very impactful and I'll, you know, I'll never forget that. Yeah. And, and he won't either. Yeah. I'm sure he, he felt that, you know, it's just, yeah. And I believe in signs and I get a lot of signs from my dad. So, um, yes. so I, I know he's still around. I, you know, I, I feel him a lot. I get it. Sunflowers are a big sign for my dad and I get a lot of sunflowers and I get a lot of helicopters and that's another big one. For oh, <laughs> yes. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story. I know sometimes it can be, it can be hard, but it can be beautiful to, to express as well. Right. It's like one of those things. Um, you want to share, but at the same time, it, it does bring up those, you know, those moments again, right? It's yeah. tough. I know I've had a lot of interviews for this book and I haven't shared that story with anybody but you. So kudos Aww. to you. You made me feel comfortable. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. Thank you. It, it, it is tough. Um, I was there as well. If I could share with you for a moment, I was there as well for my dad. Uh, my dad had um, a rare form of liver cancer. So he was sick only for four to six months. Wow. Um, but I was four months pregnant. I had just had a miscarriage about a year before and we had tried for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, what do you mean I'm pregnant? I don't even see my husband these days. Like I've just been going, like I'm about an hour. I live about an hour from where my dad was. Mm-hmm. And so every chance I would get, I would go up and down. So I too, like you was worried, um, had said to myself, it's funny when you said that because not funny, but I can understand it because it's like, well, I, what if I'm not there? It'll be okay. Like you just, you just don't know, like his life, his life and his death is not based around what I'm doing, you know, like it's okay. But I was also fortunate to be there and got a call as well um, that said, okay, it's time you need to come down. So, you know, it gave me a couple hours leeway to, to get there. Um, but it's just, uh, I don't know. I, I think as much as we can tell our story, nobody will ever really know how it felt for us in those moments, you know, and that's okay. That's something that we share with our own families and, and we share, you know, I'm getting emotional just talking about it because it is so um, difficult sometimes to face those things. Right. Well, and I've been, you know, I'm pretty, pretty open book and, um, and, you know, I talk about signs and I talk about those things. And so um, about a week ago, um, I had a girlfriend that reached out to me and her, basically her second father, I mean, her uncle that, that raised her a lot um, had been very ill with pancreatic cancer. And she, she's like, Susan, you're the only person I could think to reach out to. And she said, I think it's, it's getting close. What do I look for? Mm-hmm. And I was able to kind of walk her through it. And she, she started texting me at, at 5.30 in the evening. And at 7.30, she texted me and she said, he's gone. And she, she's been so, she was so grateful because she said, I was able to get all my cousins. I was able to get my family members around and just, just be there. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I mean, and I think that a lot of people, you know, they're, we're fearful of death. I mean, we're always fearful of the unknown and it's, it's an, it's an inevitable process. I mean, it's going to happen to all of us. It hurts. I know it hurts, but it's just like, you know, I, it was such a gift for me Mm. to be able to be like a sounding board for her and to kind of walk her through to help her get prepared. Mm -hmm. And I, 
she'll never know how much, I mean, I've told her I was, cause she's been so grateful to me. And I said, you have no idea what kind of gift you gave me. You gave me the gift of service. Mm. And, you know, and it's just, it's so great when you can, you can be there for somebody else because I also have a little bit of time, you know, I mean, if it was the first year, I mean, maybe not, um, but, but having, you yeah. know, about three years, three and a half years passed, I'm able to show up in that way that I, that I don't think I could have initially, because I just did, I think the first year for me, at least the first year I was numb. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second year, I think the second year is so much harder because I think it's now you're realizing this is the reality mm -hmm. and, you know, and it, I, I get torn on if you should share that with people or not share that with people. Right. Because they're like, Oh, you're the first, that's sure, always the hardest. Share. It's, it's your own unique thing, you know, and you won't, nobody will have a story exactly like yours. And that's why it's important that you just, you just honor it. You know, you feel like it is the way it was for you and that's it. Nobody can take that away. Right. So it's okay to share because yeah. you never know who it's going to help. Honestly. Yeah. I agree. I it's agree. tough. And the more you hold it in, like, I know I did that for so long, the more you kind of hide from your life. Right. And it's, it's not good. It's not healthy. Like, don't do that. If you're listening to this show, do not suppress your feelings because it just, and you end up having to deal with the grief and all these other things you've created for yourself. So it's definitely not a good idea. So my favorite quote is by Marcus Aurelius. And it's get active in your own rescue. I've never heard that, you know, beautiful. Yeah. It's, I read the, the daily stoic almost every day and it has like, you know, by the, by the stoics and then it kind of applies it to real life, but get yeah. active in your own rescue, I think is so, so important because I think sometimes, uh, I mean, we can totally play the victim mentality from oh, time yeah. to time. I mean, we just can, or we just say, let's sit in the middle of the room saying, who's going to save us. But sometimes okay. we just have to remember to show up for ourselves and be our own hero. Um, so when I heard that quote, be active in your own res rescue, it just resonated so much with me because it's just how I'm put together. I mean, yeah. my dad was like that too. I mean, it's just, if you're having a bad day, move a muscle, change a thought. I mean, only you have the power <laughs> to, you know, get off your ass and get out the door and change oh your my situation. God. It's so true. And my next book is actually called no one's coming to save you. So oh, I love it. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> You know, and I don't know that you can see it right now, but I have this bird cage. Um, it's this black bird cage. Mm -hmm. And one day I was sitting in the corner, you know, oh, whoa, this is me and all this stuff. And I always felt like I was trapped in this cage, right? And it wasn't until I realized, and I was just fiddling with it and crying or whatever I was doing. And I remember it didn't have a lock and it locked, like it unlocked from the inside. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I can let myself out. Yeah. Like it wasn't until that moment. And I was like, oh, I can go back in if I want, when I want to feel safe, but I can go out, you know? And no matter, like I have very loving friends and very loving family, but nobody could help me because I didn't allow that, yeah. you know? And I think it's true until you are ready and have had enough of your stuff, then you, you do need to, you may need to make, like, we all need a community. Like I really want to end loneliness. Um, and we need a community, you know, to do that, but it has to start with us. Yeah. It has to. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to read that book. That's, <laughs> that sounds like it's right up my alley. <laughs> it's just that I, I believe it to be true a hundred percent. And I lived it for 12 years. So I just, yeah, it's just, so if you can, okay. I know that you agree with being proactive through your grief right mm -hmm. so can you tell me a little bit like as we're talking about you know kind of be be the person that starts your get yourself like no one's coming to save me kind of thing like what how does somebody go through so for me um you know I've always been a person that you know like I shared earlier like if I'm having a bad day I try to do something for somebody else and so you know um I about a year after my dad passed I became a hospice volunteer um, and because to me, I thought it was like a, kind of giving a living tribute to him, so to speak, and also to the hospice people that were so good to my family. Um, because, you know, I think hospice gets kind of a bad connotation. Like you trigger it and the person's gone in like a week, you know, I mean, it's just people can graduate from hospice people can, you know, it's just, oh, yes. it's, it's totally different and it's, it's supporting the whole family. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, to get through any type of grief. I mean, working out is something that's very near and dear to my heart, um, just for my mental health. 
Mm. Um, just for my mental health and just the endorphins that I get from that. And, you know, if I miss two days in a row, then I'm not really the nicest person to, <laughs> to be around. Um, but that was something that was very important to me. Um, I also, like I said, I do the hospice um, volunteer work. Um, you know, if I see anybody on social media that mentions that they've lost somebody, I reach out to them privately. You know, a lot of times people can make comments on, you know, the picture that gets posted and stuff like that. And I remember how overwhelming that was. And so I message them privately and just try to be supportive that way. Um, because then, um, I think that it, it resonates more. It's more personal. It's not just like that. Oh, I'm, I'm putting a post on your Facebook page because I want to look like a good person. It's like, you know, almost like the, the random act of kindness done in private, you know, type of thing. But, um, the other thing that I try to do is remember to check in with the person three months after six months after Yes, it's, that's the thing is a lot of times people are so good in the first month and then they just, you know, it's not their fault. I mean, it's just, it's your journey. It's not on them to make you feel better, but it's just like people that have gone through it. I think understand that, you know, sometimes six months down the road can be the hardest. And so I try to remember to kind of show up that way as well. And then just also, you know, try to lift other people up, try to empower other people. I mean, I do a lot of, um, you know, recognition of women in my industry and just try to lift other people up that way, because, you know, I mean, that makes me feel good too. So. That's incredible. I love that. I wish I could have, uh, you know, met your dad. He sounds like incredible, like the way he, I don't know, because, you know, you are a product of your parents most of the time, right? And I think you're fantastic. Yeah, I'm a mini Roger Combs, that's for sure. Like, <laughs> so, and you know what, that's like the ultimate compliment for me. So Aww. it's, you know, he was a, he was a great guy. So I was actually back in Missouri um, this past weekend and I was there for a board meeting. And so there were people there that had gone to law school with my dad or that were in the military with my dad. And so it was really kind of neat to just hear some stories. Cause those, I mean, some of those college stories are a little bit crazy, but um, you know, it's just, it's just kind of fun to be able to connect with people um, in that way too. Yeah. Write them down, you know, because in like 50 years from now, you can read them back and say, oh, I forgot about that. Or just write them down. You know, I know you've written the book and there's probably lots of beautiful stories in there. Yeah. But Well, one of the things that I did for my dad, um, so my father passed away, he was um, 72. Mm. And um, for his 70th birthday, I put together a photo book and that I reached out to people from all of his different circles. And I said, give me a thought, a story or a letter. And so it was, and so like the goal was to get 70, right? Because it was his 70th birthday, but we, I got over a hundred wow. and it was just like people that had gone with him to this one room schoolhouse, people that had been in the military with him, people that had, you know, served, um, you know, went to law school with him, you know, just people from his church, people from the community and uh, like in our family. And I remember, and I, I gave it to him on his 70th birthday wow. and he just couldn't even, <laughs> he couldn't even really process it at first. And it was the day after he came to me and he said, you know, he said, I don't think I reacted properly. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, he said, basically you gave me a book and says, here, here's your life. Oh. And he said, it was overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's just, it's just beautiful. And so, um, the day before he passed, I read from the book to him and just read, you know, all the stories. You're going to get me going again. Yeah. Like, honestly, <laughs> just, you know, but our, our family, we were laughing and we were just, yes. you know, enjoying that stuff. And then my, you know, my, I have two nieces now. So I have a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Um, and so the four-year-old was a year old when my dad passed away. So she does, she, she doesn't, she knows through pictures who her grandpa is, but, but she doesn't, she's not going to ever remember him. So for Christmas, um, after he passed, I made a copy of that book for her and Aww. put a letter in the front and said, you know, this, I want you to know your grandpa because, you know, through, through these people that took the time to share these thoughts and letters and stories, it makes him come to life for her. So, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, a four-year-old is probably not going to appreciate it right now, but I think yeah. when she's 24 year old, you know, 24 years old, I think she'll, she'll have a greater appreciation for it. So that makes me happy. And your brother probably loved that too, that, that gesture, you know, that's so great. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> He's oh, a boy. Man, right. Yeah. <laughs> But that's so, I don't know, I think that's so sweet, because I think you can learn a lot. You don't always have to know the person to know 
who they impacted and who, you know, what they stood for and what they were about. And, and sometimes those are the things that create the best emotions, right? Like, yeah, some of the, uh, some of the stories I heard after too, are like, I don't know that they would have had the same effect if I had heard them before. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can understand that. I totally can. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Is there anything we didn't talk about today that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> oh, there's plenty of stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was lovely. Thank you so much for having me now. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. And you know, yeah, I just, I don't know. I'm still feeling like I feel I had all these emotions come up during our conversation, but that's a good thing. And I really appreciate you coming here and sharing your story. And I love, love, love what you're doing with the book and just the whole movement, you know, it's beautiful. Keep me posted on what you're doing and yeah. And uh, thank you so much. And I'm going to put all the links, you know, do you want to tell us what your website is? Yeah, so actually they can go to, it's just pancakesroger.com. It's pretty easy. Um, and that links to, you know, you can buy the book on Amazon and everything. And so it's, um, but, it, and you'll see like um, through the pancake campaign, um, because we hit all 50 states and we got, I think, wow. 18 countries this year during our campaign. So it's just really kind of spidered out. So and we still get people, I get people that say, oh, I can't have pancakes now and not think about your dad. And I'm like, well, that's me too. That's, no, cool. that's going to be me. And I don't even know, I haven't even met you in person yet. <laughs> I'm trying to meet some of my guests in person. But yeah, I just, yeah, now I'm going to be thinking of that. And it's, it just kind of like, it's a fun, it's a fun yeah. title too, right? So it's, yeah. it's really cool. Yeah. So, and part of the proceeds of the book will go, go to the veterans clinic too. So it's just, it's great to, that I can stay tethered in and connected to them as well. Um, and, you know, do something for our veterans because my dad was very passionate about veterans and, and, uh, the armed forces and everything as well. And I'm sure your mom is super proud too, that you did that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Depends mothers and daughters, you know, <laughs> yeah, best friends, worst enemies. I've got, I love my mother to death, but yeah, we could be best friends and best enemies within an hour, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. But thanks so much again for sharing your story and for sharing, you know, just your, your genuine feelings about it. Like not being, I don't know. I like when we have genuine conversations. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah, and my, like I think the military, we call it WYSIWYG. What you see is what oh, you get. So WYSIWYG. that's I love it. I'm pretty WYSIWYG. That. Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode. If you enjoyed what you heard, please subscribe or leave a review. See you next week on the Giving Starts With You podcast.